my name's Jade and today I'm going to be going through all the books that I read in November. In November I read six novels, one short story I think, and one graphic novel, so there's a total of eight books which isn't too shabby. It does leave me in the predicament where I have like 18 or so books away from 100 from reaching 100 books this year uh, and I wasn't I wasn't gonna do that this year. I did that last year and I beat it and it was amazing and I was gonna take it take it easier this year but now that I'm so close kind of tempted to try and get to 100 so we'll see what happens. The first book that I finished in November was Gallant by V.E. Schwab. I read the majority of this in October because it's got the spooky vibes. It's just that I finish it on November 1st technically. Gallant is well <sighs> Victoria describes it as like ageless, like in her mind it was an adult horror, but it has like a YA age protagonist and there's nothing in here like particularly scary or unsettling, like there's nothing in here that would suggest a young adult couldn't read it, so I think it's been marketed as YA, although it also, like I feel like it could even maybe verge into children's because we don't know the age of our protagonist, we just know that she's a young woman a young girl how would i give you a premise follow an orphan named olivia i think her name's olivia Pryor. yeah she is in an orphanage when the book opens and she hates it there she doesn't feel like she belongs i mean you know it's the typical orphanage misunderstood child she has no family she does have this diary that was her mother's that came with her when she was dropped off at the orphanage and it has this kind of broken story of what happened to her mother and then one day a letter arrives saying that no she does have family out there and I'd really like her to come to Gallant and Gallant in her mother's diary at the end is warned that Olivia will be safe as long as she never goes to Gallant she's kind of shipped away there she doesn't really get a choice the orphan is orphan just kind of like well if someone else wants you then away with you and we we follow the kind of the mystery of what happened to her mother and Gallant. The writing was gorgeous. This is my second V.E. Schwab novel. I read The Invisible Life of Adi Leroux earlier this year and that was my first. The writing is just as beautiful in my opinion. And the atmosphere. I think that's the strongest part of the book. It's very, very atmospheric. Almost like the night circus in that. That's what you're reading it for. You're reading it for the atmosphere. In my opinion, the plot and the story I liked the idea. I liked the, the premise behind this. I obviously can't talk too much about what it is because spoilers, but just like from the covers <laughs> of this book and like what I've heard people kind of talk, like I had a very strong idea of what it was going to be about, like what the premise was, and I, I, I was incredibly close. <laughs> so I'm not sure I love like the marketing of this book. I think it gives a lot of it away and it takes a really long time to get to that place in the book. And I think that's one of my problems with it. I wish that it had more equal weighting like when it's revealed like what's really going on. I wish that was at the halfway point so we could have like it would be equal in weighting or like thereabouts and I think like symbolically that would make a lot more sense. I think there's all this preamble to trying to get there like it was very slow and I didn't mind it. I was never bored. I was always interested. It had like a story storybook fairy tale esque quality to it and I didn't mind that but it was very slow and I don't think it necessarily needed to be. And like realistically that that second chunk is where most of the story is. Up until that point it is just preamble to get to where we're going and trying to kind of I guess try and uncover the mystery but like I said I, I had a pretty strong idea what was going on. <laughs> the other little bits and pieces are picked up relatively quickly when they are picked up so it's just like chunks of time in between because in like in hindsight the actions of the book and the plot doesn't seem very strong to me like like I said at the time I didn't mind I, I was enjoying it and like the end got quite actiony and it felt very disingenuous with the rest of it and it all happened very quickly in the end it's so frustrating because I really enjoyed the premise and all the symbolisms that went with that there was a lot of potential here and it just it wasn't the story that I ended up wanting it to be but then like if you read it for the atmosphere. It was done really well. It, it got quite creepy a couple times and like I did enjoy it and the writing was gorgeous so it has strengths too. <laughs> I think I'd give it a 7 out of 10. I still enjoyed it. I just don't think it's the strongest. Ugh. I'm really excited to read more of V.E. Schwab. I really want to read um Oh, the London one with the parallel universes, the darker state of magic, those ones. Next up, I read I'm the Girl by Courtney Summers. I audiobooked this one. I've audiobooked all of Courtney Summers' books that I've read thus far. It's narrated by Laurie Prince. I've 
read Sadie and the Project by Courtney Summers. Sadie was her blow-up book. Like she's written books before that, but she's gotten more popular since. Like I feel like Terry Jenkins Reid is another one of those authors there. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo blew her up. But she's got a backlog. <laughs> I do intend to reading the backlog of, of both of those authors, to be honest. I'm the Girl is a spiritual successor to the 2018 breakout hit Sadie. I'm the Girl is a masterfully written and unflinching account of how one young woman feels in her body as she struggles to navigate a deadly and predatory power structure while asking readers one question. Is if this is the way blah, 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 blah. if this is the way the world is, do you accept it? <sighs> I also just kept hearing People talk about how it's queer, like Courtney Summers is very adamant that it's queer. It opens with Georgia discovering the body of a 13 year old girl, Ashley James. Ashley's older sister Nora is trying to figure out what happened to her. Georgia kind of has her own family history, specifically tied to this place called Aspera, and she desperately wants to work there. There's shady goings on left, right, and center. It's a Courtney Summers book. It was really well written. I think all of Courtney Summers' books are that I've read. They've all been really entertaining. They're all really addicted. All three of these, it just gets to a point where I don't want to put the book down, where I just want to like get to the end. I just need to know what's happening. Very thought provoking. They've all got such interesting themes and Courtney Summers does such a good job of writing unapologetically flawed women, young women, and that's kind of her MO, if it were, like writing real women going through real struggles and, and they're flawed and they're messy and they're allowed to be that. That being said, this main character I found to be particularly naive. I was just screaming at her the whole book and I get being naive, but like was she raised under a rock? <laughs> like does she not understand? Dad. That is the whole point, is about her naivety. Like she, again, she has, she's well within her right to be naive. She shouldn't have to have this guard up all the time. I mean, we do have to have this guard up on the time, but we shouldn't have to. We don't live in a society that protects young women. I feel like it's common knowledge, all the safety precautions that women have to take. She just doesn't get it. She just doesn't, she doesn't, she doesn't acknowledge any of them. It's hard because I, I had a good idea of where I was going. I had a good idea of who we can and can't trust. I had a good idea of some of the shady stuff that was going on behind the scenes. And I, I didn't understand the main mystery, like how the pieces fit together. It wasn't until someone explained to them that I understood. And even then I was like, what? <laughs> I had to reread that section. It felt a little messy. For the most part, my gut was, it was right. Like I, you know, like, it, it, I, I, <laughs> these are the things that women are trained to look out for and I, it is fascinating like I said it's very thought provoking and the more I think about it the more like these themes and topics and the more I can interrogate it like this is interesting this discussion right now that I'm opening up I think is an important discussion and I think that's another reason why Courtney writes these books these are important things that we're talking about and no one is she's not afraid to shy away from ugliness she'll run towards it <laughs> she's, she's there and I feel like the more I listen to her in interviews like stand up for Georgia the more I could be swayed. <laughs> because I mean, characters are allowed to be problematic and they're allowed to be flawed. It's, that's not the problem. The problem is, is the reading experience and when the reading experience is so frustrating that it becomes unenjoyable. And I think it almost walked to the line at times because what am I trying to say? The character, the progress, her progress, her character development, she wasn't learning. She wasn't, ex she, like, she wasn't willing to listen to anyone. She just was so steadfast in what she thought was right and that was that and had like more or less the same perspective the whole way through. I like, I just needed a little. I just needed her to give a little. <laughs> I finished it thinking that is my least favorite Courtney Summers book that I've read thus far. But I can see my perspective changing over time because it is so interesting and it is such, I, I mean, this topic in general is something I could blab on about forever. I think it's important to have this discussion and if this book incites that, then power to it. I'm very excited to see what Courtney Summers puts out. I would give I'm the Girl an eight out of 10. <sighs> words are not coming easily to me today. Like I know what I wanna say, they just can't put them into words. It happens to me all the time and it's so frustrating. Anyway, the next book I finished was Meddling Kids by Edgar Cantero. I started this one again in October because it's, it's it's a play on the Scooby-Doo, like you can tell from the title. It's a play on like the Scooby-Doo, the Famous Five, there's another one, um, the Hardy Boys maybe. It's about a group of kids that when they were younger they would solve these mysteries and it's about when they're older and the fallout of that and 
something doesn't quite sit right about one of the mysteries that they sold and so they go back and revisit it. I audiobooked this one and it was narrated by the author. I didn't know that until I looked up to film this video and he did a really good job. I think I would have enjoyed it more without the audiobook though and I can't say why because he he was very enthusiastic in his retelling. I just think there was something about the story and the pacing. I found myself like drifting off a lot and then I knew that I wasn't paying attention but I didn't care enough to go back and figure out what was properly going on and so I feel like especially towards the end like the mystery all coming together there were definitely bits that I missed. I would be open to rereading it someday. I did sit down and read chunks physically I found it a lot easier to take in so I don't know what it was about the audiobook maybe I just wasn't in the mood. I think this is the kind of book that I would personally like to have my own interpretation on but I didn't. I was too lazy to so just keep that in mind. <laughs> the premise of this was so much fun. There were so many little easter eggs to like Scooby-Doo and Enid Blyton and probably more that I don't know. There was like a Zonks River and they lived in Blyton Hills and that was all very fun. I loved what he did with the genre and with this kind of premise and like these adults are kind of messy and a little bit messed up because of what they went through as kids understandably so fighting great it was so fun and playful like we'd see from the dog's perspective every now and then and every now and then we'd go into script and like people would be imagining in their heads as if it were a film like what was going on the characters all felt very real they were very entertaining i didn't really have any qualms with the characters my biggest problem with it besides the fact that like I kept drifting off and not paying attention would be the pacing and the plot and this is kind of tied in together again somewhat similarly to Gallant there's a lot of preamble going on here before we get to their like childhood town where the mystery is taking place that's fine like we need that I think to establish the characters and their relationships and their situations and the mystery itself it could have been done a little quicker probably and a little more succinctly sure I think the problem is is that then the last part the mystery part like there are bits where it got a little rushed also just like the scale of it and i wasn't expecting it. again maybe if i was concentrating and reading it properly that might not have happened so in the long run i don't see this being something that sticks out in my mind that i think about super often i really enjoyed it in the beginning i enjoyed trying to figure out what the mysteries i enjoyed some of the easter eggs of you know these famous stories and the playfulness of it i think if it sounds interesting to you i would recommend picking it up um, I think a lot of the problem was in the form that I read it. I don't think the audiobook worked for me, but I did. I was lazy. So we're here. I personally would give it a 6 out of 10. I really like this cover as well. I It's not the UK cover, but I prefer this one. I love the colours. Um, yeah. Next up was Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor, the first book in the Strange the Dreamer duology. I had at least five years. I want to say it's been at least five years since I read the last book in the Daughter's Book and Bone trilogy, let alone when I started the trilogy. It, like, I read it a while ago, <laughs> but I love that trilogy. It's one of my favourite trilogies I've ever read. I own three different editions of it. I'm something of a Lainey Taylor stan. Her writing and her worlds are so amazing, and so I put Stranger Dreamer off for a while. Obviously, it came out in like I want to say 2017? 2017, yeah. But I've owned it for a long time. And I feel like every year is the year that I'm like, this year, this year I'm going to read it. I don't really want to give you a synopsis. I think it's best going in knowing minimal amount. I had read the prologue. We were in the city of Weep and a woman falls from the sky. Her skin is blue. She lands on a gate, like a railing, and it impels her and she dies. Little moths come and try and fly her away. And... All of the people, the people of the city of Weep are freaking out. They just scream and they're terrified. Oh, look. On the second Sabbath of Twelfth Moon in the city of Weep, a girl fell from the sky. Her skin was blue. Her blood was red. It's a fantasy. It's high fantasy. We're in a completely different world. In the first chapter, we then switch to Laszlo Strange's kind of perspective. It's third person, but we follow him. And he opens up the story, but it's about two people really a second kind of perspective comes maybe a third of the way through a quarter of the way through laszlo he's a dreamer he's a reader he wanted to travel to the city of weep and people kind of forgot about it it was wiped from everyone's memories like the mystery of the city of weep why did everyone start forgetting about it and, and what's going on there i love the kind of slow unraveling of the story i do wonder again if it was a little too slow in the beginning we spent a lot of time with laszlo this this seems to be a theme this month 
just like in hindsight like i think that could have been cut down a little but i'm not mad at it i enjoyed that section and again it is character building it is setting up so i don't think it's necessary unnecessary maybe could have been done a little quicker but i mean laney has gorgeous writing so more writing for us who cares for a while i thought this was going to be one of those you know every now and then you get a book that's just perfect it's just perfect there's, you, there's nothing you could critique about it and if it is it's pedantic and you don't really care and there's just something about it that like connects your heart to the book and that you you can't really describe why and it wasn't it, i there were just like one or two pedantic little things but that i i couldn't overlook them <laughs> i couldn't like i couldn't stand here and tell you this is like 10 out of 10 i have no problems with it but it's close like i would still say it's a phenomenal duology overall like i already said daughter smoke and bone trilogy is one of my favorites i gave the first book a 9 out of 10 the second book a 10 out of 10 and the third book an 8 out of 10 and i really want to reread that duology and see how it compares now and to be fair when i read the last book i thought it was really really good but i read it quite a distance from blood and starlight the second book and i like stopped halfway through and like waited six months to pick up the second half of the book so i didn't have a clue what was going on so i think i'd have a very different experience reading it now her writing has this quality to it that's so beautiful and i can't put it into words it feels like ice and sugar and like magic and it's in everything i've heard that i've read so far so her writing's so gorgeous her worlds are gorgeous her characters are so interesting and funny but the problem is and i know that she writes interesting funny amazing characters because of the daughter and spoken bone trilogy i felt a little bit distanced from some of them in here like i said there's kind of two different perspectives going on two different groups one of them i thought was really well done and fleshed out and interesting and complicated and layered the f laszlo his journey i wanted to spend more time there i want to spend more time with him discovering and figuring out and just like having bounce with his friends because he was such a, a funny character but he rarely got time to shine his like funny snarky comments i wanted more of that that's that's my biggest that's that, that's the biggest problem um the only other thing I would say, dreams are really important in this book. Not in an annoying way. Like, you hear that and you go, ah, it will make sense when you read it why they're important. And there's a dream sequence that's like 60 pages long and it just like completely derails from the plot. And it's just like literally about these two characters getting to know each other. And it's cute and it's sweet. It's just very long. I almost wish it was broken up and then the two characters would have spent more time with each other. Because it's almost the danger of feeling a little insta lovey almost like i i will accept it but it definitely definitely instant attraction i think that's fine but it just felt very strong the connection between these two people who knows maybe that is a thing that happens maybe people meet each other and just fall in love and that's that they're in love laney is definitely a very romantic writer she's big on the romance like, it, it gets a little smushy at times but that's it that's all i have criticism wise it's the writing's gorgeous the world is gorgeous it's so colorful and interesting i i wish we could spend more time like on the ground <laughs> it's so hard to talk about because i was so like vague in my synopsis but if you've read it you'll know what i mean i think yeah i think as a duology i spoiler i read the second book this month as well as a duology i wrote it is phenomenal and it's stunning and i think it's a new favorite of mine probably i would give strange dreamer a 9 out of 10. next was a book that i've ordered like over a week ago and it's still not here and i'm getting a little worried about it but that was dating you hating you by christina lauren i read quite a few christina lauren's books now dating you hating you is like the first of these rom-coms that they wrote like after their kind of random like thrillery standalones and their series is so it's a little apprehensive as to what it was going to be like because their other earlier books Rumi's and Josh and Hazel's Guide to Not Dating they're not my favorite of theirs I was worried that maybe it was a thing that their books got stronger over time and I'm not gonna like this one either but I actually ended up really enjoying it it's about a man and a woman obviously their names escape me right now they meet at a party and they kind of hit it off and they have all this chemistry with each other but then their companies they both work as agents within the film industry and their companies merge and so they kind of end up fighting for the same role and it's really fun the premise of this one was so much fun i really enjoyed it in the end it's just it's a lot of fun and it's really juicy and like it might even be viable for a new top three i think i enjoyed it more than i enjoyed something wilder by them maybe even the unhoneymooners i don't know i really enjoyed it I was really shipping the couple and I really enjoyed both of the characters. Audiobook was great. Um, I audiobook all of Christina Lauren's books. This one is narrated by Shayna Lauren and Deacon Lee. Deacon Lee narrated a little bit in the Unhoneymooners. 
I would give this one a 7 out of 10, a high 7 out of 10. Next up was the short story I read this month and that is Patience and Not Forsaken by Alex E. Harrow who wrote the like the 1000 Doors of Tuesday or something to that effect and the Once and Future Witches which I read in September and I loved that book. I gave it a 10 out of 10. I said it was like a new favourite, probably favourite book I've read of the year but I'm I'm starting to second guess it a little bit but anyway I was I'm definitely so keen to read more of her work. I think her writing was really strong. I think this would have been better in October. It's a spooky short story, kind of Patience looks into the mirror and a different girl looks back. But it's not that scary, like it's not hardcore on the creepy vibes, like it's also just about Patience growing up, kind of. And I thought it was interesting, but it, it just didn't stand out to me. It wasn't creepy enough, the direction of the story went wasn't impactful enough, like the message it was trying to get across, I think. Yeah, I just don't really have any strong feelings about it, it was just kind of okay. I, I couldn't, I can't give it anything more than a... 4 out of 10, just because I don't feel strongly enough about it. Next up was the graphic novel that I read this month and that is Demon in the Woods by Lee Bardugo and Danny Pendergast, which is a Shadow and Bone graphic novel as it says on the title about the Darkling or the events of Shadow and Bone before he is the Darkling as it were. The art in here was really pretty, it's kind of like more of a cartoony style but it is nice. I did like the art quite a lot. I think it fit quite well. I had to go onto like a Grisha wiki and try and figure out the backstory of the Dark and what it even was and what we hear it as in the Shadow and Bone trilogy for it to like make sense to me. Maybe trying to understand what led him to become the person he became in the Shadow and Bone trilogy. I think that's what it was trying to do. I don't think the story particularly interesting. I like this sounds so mean. I really love the Grisha world and I like I enjoyed being back there and like remembering all of the little details and stuff. I just don't think it was necessary. I don't think it added anything to the story. It was like trying to understand the Darkling. I I kind of think Lee in general is just walking a fine line there where he's such an interesting character and he's so old and mysterious. And I think we just need to leave him that way. Like I don't love what she ended up doing in the end. <laughs> trying to be vague and spoiler free. So again. I'd give this one a 4 out of 10. And then the last book that I read this month, can you guess it, was Muse of Nightmares by Lainey Taylor, the second book in the Strange the Dreamer duology. I think this one in the mind sits very similarly to the first book. I think I kind of have the same issue with Laszlo a little bit. He's got a really interesting personality, but we only ever see him being like serious and trying to figure stuff out. We don't get to see him just be fun very much, apart from the relationship situation, and it is very smushy in this one. It's not Leslie being stressed and like trying to figure stuff out. It's him being like like disgustingly romantic, which is fine. It just got a little much for me at points. The pacing of this one was interesting. It was very slow for the first two thirds. Like it was a lot of like, how are we gonna figure this out? And then all of a sudden it like was 100 miles per hour. That moment two thirds in, I feel like if you've read it, you'll have a rough idea. From then on till the end of the book, I'm not exaggerating. Every few chapters, I would become hysterical. I like I couldn't be soothed. And I read this over a course of three different nights, and it was three different nights of just like non-stop crying. It was emotional. This ending was very moving. We're talking about powerful emotions and healing and trauma, and it's so touching. I was a mess, but I was glad to be a mess. I was I was thanking Lainey for putting me through that mess. I mean, no, I wasn't. I was at the time saying, Lainey, what are you doing to me here? But. I'm, I'm glad that she did that to me. I think it was a very satisfying ending. Only thing that's like slightly questionable was that, that first two thirds because it is quite slow. But I still enjoyed it. Critically, is it the best? Maybe not. But I enjoyed it. So it, it's hard to weigh up. Like I said before, it's a beautiful duology. It's very likely going to become one of my new favourites. If you like high fantasy, if you like beautiful stories and gorgeous writing and like weird interesting plots that slowly unravel, highly recommend <laughs> Lainey Taylor, highly recommend this duology. I would give it Moons of Nightmares a 9 out of 10 as well. Chef's kiss. But yes, thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any thoughts on the books I mentioned today, or if you want to discuss what you read in November, I'd love to discuss it with you in the comments below. If you were to like and subscribe, that would help me out a lot. I hope you have a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, slash night. My name's Jade. I hope I see you again next time. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.